I, on behalf of Legends of India, welcome you to yet another edition of Pendulum Dialogue, an Art Appreciation Lecture Series. The topic this evening, are our artists living in silos of their karanas and art forms? Before we begin the session this evening, I'm sure all of you, all of you know that the matter of belief, that the spirit behind this concept, like Pendulum Dialogue, Shantaji, Shanta Sarji Singh, is no more. I remember that only a month ago, before her demise, she joined us at the IIC in spite of her ailing health to give the final shape to this series. Some of our friends would recall that Shantaji as a panelist once again will recall how passionately Shantaji was involved in setting up Pendulum Dialogue. I remember from the very inception of this concept, she personally took pains in deciding on the subjects, talking to all the problem speakers, getting their confirmation, writing to them, reminding me of it at every step what to do and how to go about it. I very well recall her contribution for the last 10 years. Whenever we needed her, for whatever, whether it was <coughs> as a judge for the Lifetime Achievement Award or anything else, she would be on the forefront. We shall miss her for all time to come. May I request you all to stand up for a minute, remembering this. portray an aesthetic temperament and her creative archive is a visual hub. Her love for art is not just a personal desire. Precisely, she bestowed her professional contribution as the member of much professional organization such as India International Center, Doordarshan Committee, Legions of India to mention a few. Her contribution to Indian art forms as Vice Chairperson of Sangeet Nadak Academy 
and Asia Pacific Performing Arts and Network, UNESCO India is memorable. We salute the Lady Dino, Shantaji, who put her heart and soul to sustain the delicacy of art and culture. Her endeavor will always navigate us in all our noble ventures in days to come. I should introduce the speakers, the panelists this evening. Uh, from my extreme left, it is Mr. Jatin Das, who needs no introduction. Mr. Jatin Das has been a panelist before for Legends of India. Uh, Pratima Pralat, but Mr. Pratima Pralat, Pratima has also been fully associated with Legends of India for a long time. Uh, Suresh Goel, Mr. Suresh Goel, you all know, is a leader who is doing the job taken up from Shantaji. <laughs> Aruna Vasudev needs no introduction in Delhi as a personality who has been promoting films and a very, very good film. Also, we expect Rama Vedanath who is walking in the dramatic, dramatic entry. So, there was Rama Vedanathan, caught up with traffic. Thank you, Rama. Thank you all. May I now request Mr. Sudeir Goel to begin the discussion. Thank you. You mentioned in your introduction to me that I'm taking over from Shantazi. Uh, I think that's a, that's a huge overstatement, really. I don't think it's possible for anyone to take over from Shantazi from where she left. Uh, her, I think, uh, the way I knew her, she was a great mind. And the greatness of the mind was not in the fact that it was a very sophisticated mind, or, but it combined a deep intellect with the simplicity of the art which actually it requires, so that it didn't go beyond. It did not remain the stratosphere people didn't understand it. It brought the simplicity of art and the intellect together to make it understandable to the people. People like me, who otherwise probably would have remained as uh, uh, <coughs> ignorant uh, about the intricacies of art. Uh, so I don't think it's possible to take, take over from her. I was hoping, when we started the dialogue again uh, two months ago, I was hoping that I would, be, I would be able to learn from her by she and I uh, working together as the co-chair of the thing, but her health been permitted, so I've had to take it up alone. Uh, hope, I hope that uh, wherever she is, she will continue to bless this endeavor. Uh, uh, in the memory of Shantaji, uh, we have also decided that the pendulum dialogue from next month will be known as Shanta Sarabhi Singh uh, discussion series on art and culture. This will be our tribute to her memory for what she started, which hopefully will begin the dialogue that we much need in this country on the issues of uh, art and culture, uh, so that people can actually begin to look at it not uh, as living civilizational beings, and then as a living civilizational ideas. Uh, with these few words, let me introduce the subject. I think uh, you have, we have a very uh, eminent uh, panel here. Uh, it doesn't really need me to say very much, but I thought let me say uh, when you read the subject, uh, inter art interaction, are our artists living in silos of their gharanas or art forms. I was a bit puzzled, to be very honest, because uh, over my life period, whatever I have seen, it did seem improbable to me that any artist could have survived or even uh, reached the heights they reached unless they were able to benefit from the other art forms. There are very few artists I know 
who become so isolated or so aloof in their own cocoons that they don't know what is happening outside. And I think basically it is a matter of perception really. Most of us who have not seen the art world from close, when we look at the musical performance, when we see the dance performance, we see that, oh, this is Bharat Natyam. So this is just Bharat Natyam, or this is uh, Odyssey, or this is just a uh, painting. Uh, not, not many people realize that when that particular event is being created, either a painting, sculpture, whatever you need, or music, when there is being created, there is a whole lot of visualization of the ideas which is going on in the mind of the artist. Well known, beginning, professional, eminent, whoever, but the visualization becomes a must for them to be able to create on the stage. And that is more true for the Indian art forms where the creation is done on the spot rather than being rehearsed or uh, you know, like in the Western music, you have the score, you have the choreographies. Here it is created on the spot within the uh, ideas, within the visualization that they have. So I, I really don't think that we can think of artists living in their own silos or the cocoon. <coughs> what may happen, and I, I think the artists will need to explore the idea in their own uh, 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 emphasis. And what may happen is that whether it is possible to have interaction between the art forms from one to the other. Say for example, uh, whether we can have something which brings together the painting, a still visual art form with performances, or whether music and, art, music and dance, they cannot exist. Uh, it is a dance not exist without music really. Therefore, I don't think it's right to say that uh, the dancer will live in a cycle. They depend on the music to give it that kind of beauty, that kind of shape, and the space that it creates. But is it possible for the different art forms to come together, interact, and create uh, not just one art form, the traditional, classical that you know, but <coughs> go beyond that and create something new? And again, uh, I find that over the last 10, 15 years, in fact, even the last 50 years, a lot of it has happened really. Uh, I don't think that Sarod, that was played by, that is being played by Ustad Amjad Ali Khan, is the same as the Sarod of Hafiz Ali Khan sir. He has progressed over that. The Bina has changed. So progress has taken place over a period of time, or the change has taken place over a period of time in all these art forms. Similarly, uh, I, I remember that for me, one of the most ethereal experience I had was in 1978 when I saw Satara Devi and Yami Krishna Murthy together on the stage in Kamali Auditorium doing Bharat Atyam and Dasa. Now, they were not living in the silo, they were actually working, they were harmonizing with each other, they were, uh, Yamini was dancing to Tabla and Satara Devi dancing sorry, uh, so there was a lot of interaction going on. So I think we need to basically use these ideas to at least uh, see whether the interaction is taking place in the right direction rather than saying that there is no interaction because I don't believe that there is no interaction but of course the artists will have their own mind that they can uh, either agree with the idea, they can refute it, whatever it is, uh, but it is up to them really. The format we are going to follow is that because we started late, so I think I'm going to cut down time for each one. Uh, what we'll do is that uh, I will request each panelist to sit, speak for about seven minutes. Uh, so that takes about half an hour. After which, it's important that they talk to each other on the idea that they have postulated in the presentation for about 10 minutes. After which, we throw over to the audiences to ask questions, comments, interact with the panelists, and uh, that will be basically completing the process. Uh, so we start with uh, Aruna, you first. Thank you, Suresh. That was a very interesting introduction. And to me, <coughs> what was most interesting is, <coughs> I've been asked to come and be a member of this panel and talk about cinema. 
but you don't mention cinema at all. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what they are from dance, music, <laughs> painting, theater, reading, but not cinema. And uh, cinema, cinema is a major art form. We do this after the panel because there are a few things I want to say about cinema. My passion has always been cinema from the times. I would acknowledge Sushma Sage here. She is sitting here, and I would request her to basically intervene, contribute. Uh, I mean, we all know she is a well-known uh, theatre personality, uh, film personality. So there is a good combination of the different art forms here. So. Whenever people talk of the arts, they never mention cinema. Because in the minds of most people, cinema is considered a form of entertainment. <coughs> Time pass. Come on, let's go see a film and relax. It's just entertainment. I want to know how many people actually look at film as the finest of all art forms, which brings all the art forms together. It's really an amazing technique, technology that brings dance, music, theater, emotions, uh, feelings, beauty, everything together. But very few people have really looked at cinema as a major form of art that it is. I'm just going to quote a few people. I wrote it down because I think they're very, very important quotes. One is from <coughs> Kamal Atatürk, you can imagine how long ago that was, which was cinema was not, was not very old at the time he said this. He said, cinema is so important a discovery that one day, cinema is so important a discovery that one day it will change the face of the world civilization far more than the discovery of gunpowder, electricity, and continents. Cinema will create possibilities for all people on this earth of knowing one another. Cinema will eliminate divergence of views among people and prove invaluable in realizing the human idea. We must accord cinema the importance it deserves. Now to me, cinema is the one form <coughs> that brings all the arts together. Because a good film is not something, uh, and that, that whole idea now is changing. It's not something you go to because you're nothing else to in the evening. So come on, let's go see a film, laugh about it, have a good time, and come away. But cinema actually, even sometimes without knowing it, introduces you to ways of living, being, thinking, acting, behaving, relationships, visually beautiful, not beautiful. What does it tell you? If you look at cinema in that way, you learn so much from even a very ordinary entertaining film. You learn about relationships, you learn about ways of dressing, dressing, the way of dressing even in India has changed so much because really because of the cinema propagated it and, and spread it. And uh, Nelson Mandela said, films are a powerful tool to foster understanding and tolerance in the world. All right, this is not talking of cinema as an art form, but it is so powerful that through bringing all these arts together, through music, through well, dialogue is not uh, an art form, but through people coming together and sharing ideas. Ideas are a form of art also. I passionately believe that. It's cinema that does it. Cinema that has brought all this together. And to me, it's the most powerful form of art that there is in the way it changed the way of dressing of people. It changed the way you look at the world around you. All that art, after all, artists, painters, Jatin, will paint a painting in the, of, of the world he sees around him, of what he feels within him, he paint that. But how will we know? If you see it in a film 
and you understand it, it means so much more to you. Pratibha will dance and you think, oh, that's wonderful, what a great dancer Pratibha is. But if you see a film on Pratibha and you see how she became what she did, is how she did it, what is it all about? It gives you a much deeper understanding of the arts than any other art form does. Uh, I, I, I can go on. Uh, I can go on for a long time, but you told me to keep it short. So this is really just an introduction to what I feel the cinema, the power of the cinema, the, uh, the attraction of the cinema, the, the, that it combines entertainment, it combines all the arts, it combines thinking, it combines ideas, and it is not by artists, unfortunately, given the importance it should be. Now the artists I've often talked to, I say to a dancer friend, come on, there's an art exhibition by so and so. Hmm, no, I'm not going to. Or you'd say to an artist, so and so singing, will you come and this? Hmm, I'd rather go and see an art exhibition. No, I'm not coming. And I find here people, artists are not coming together. Which maybe it's not true only for India, it could be around the world, but around the world you do see, at least Europe, which I know a bit because I've lived a long time in Europe, you do see artists go to music, you see dancers go to see art, you, you, they, they all come together and they meet also and they discuss what they're doing. But here all the forms are so isolated. The only thing that does show them together, show them, bring them together, is the cinema. I'll stop there and I'll uh, Thank you very much. That, that was wonderful. The reason I didn't mention cinema is simple here. Cinema is a very, very peculiar kind of art form. No, it's not uh, peculiar. Yes, I do. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> it's a very peculiar kind of art form where the <coughs> boundaries between the realism and the imagination somehow fades so rapidly, so quickly. Uh, people find reflection of their own desires, their own dreams on the screen, and they seem to somehow live the dream on the screen. When somebody watches Raj Kapoor in Avara, they see themselves actually on the screen. So in that sense, they actually tend to become one with the screen. That is a fun. If you see Pratibha dancing on the stage, I can't even think of dancing like her. I can't see myself in her dancing. So that's the difference between the cinema and the... Yeah, of course, but, of course. But, but one thing which you can touch, and I think you should touch in the day, uh, is has cinema created a side of its own? When cinema becomes part of the popular culture, you create that kind of uh, distinction between the popular culture and the classical culture. I remember that earlier, uh, before the talkies came, before the movies came, either there would be folk, folk culture or classical culture. There was nothing for the popular culture at that time. A completely new genre had been created. No, I, it, no, no, we have you read the I must tell you that, that in the beginning when cinema was created, when it first came to India, <coughs> was looked down upon as very vulgar entertainment for the masses. But the first films made were made on mythology because they were meant for people who were not educated, who were not city bred, but story and there was no sound. So they took stories from mythology which the ordinary people could understand and could see. I mean, there's so much about cinema. Anyway, this I just is wanted to mention that. Anyway, this conversation will take place after uh, it is your turn to say Thank your name. Of course. Suresh, <coughs> may I just add yeah. one piece about cinema? Mm -hmm. so they have all this music composers and the writers who like write the lyrics. They have all always use classical forms in dance also, the dance forms also, and the music, and the dialogue. They have all 
classical dance, on Indian classical dance, is to enter the world of philosophy, literature, poetry, painting, sculpture, music, all, all at once. So I stand here as a, as a multi, you know, what do you want to say, multiple artists rolled in one. I think any dancer is that or should be that. Because you cannot be a classical dancer if you don't understand the philosophy of what you're performing. You cannot be a classical dancer if you don't understand the music. Or, for example, you know, there's always a you know a debate on what came first, sculpture or dance. Many sculptors say that dancers influenced their sculptures. And well, dancers have actually never said that you know, uh, sculptors influence them. Though I think literature, poetry, music influences dance a lot, a lot, a great deal. As a classical dancer, what is, I mean, I, I'm very happy to see so many youngsters here in the audience today, and I know that all of you think, most of you think of classical dance as something that is ethnic, museumized, and is not relevant or contemporary. But um, I would like to tell all of you that any art form is as contemporary as the artist himself or herself. And if the artist is contemporary, the thought process and what the artist is projecting on stage is contemporary. Classical dance always gravitates towards the absolute in terms of love, heroism, um, you know, or, or all the emotions that we have on an everyday basis, we experience on an everyday basis. Sorrow, anger, um, yeah, repentance, hatred, uh, you know, I mean, uh, so many other emotions which we call the ashta bhavas mm -hmm. in classical dance, but these are normal emotions take, taken out of life and projected in a stylized, stylistic form. What is perhaps interesting about classical dance is that it did not start off as a silo, a word that is being often used today. It did not start off as a solo, unique, I mean, you know, unaffected, untouched art form, because like I said, it draws so many things, so many strands from philosophy, literature, poetry, painting, from, from life itself, as Aruna said, from human emotions, from so many things. So classical dance was a composite art form, and a classical dancer had to be a composite um, persona to be able to project that art form. Even the great Nati Shastra, which uh, you know, many scholars attribute to about 2,600 years or 3,000 years ago, talks about a dancer, talks about the um, you know, attributes of a dancer and says the dancer should have a mellifluous voice, I mean, apart from the physical attributes, that she should understand philosophy, she should understand religion, she should understand aesthetics, I presume they meant um, sculpture, architecture, aesthetics, and stringing all these strands together, she stands as a dancer on stage and projects these various art forms through her own dance. So classical dance never started off as a cyber. It is, as a contemporary dancer, I do understand why we talk about this. Because somewhere in the 1900s, early 20th century, or maybe even the early 21st century, most artists became, you know, uh, specialists. They started specializing, specializing in whatever it was. 
Like, for example, there were these gurus, and that's where the word gharana comes from. So we had in Bharatanatyam, they say they were, you know, great gurus, and they started their own stylistic <coughs> dance form, which was very, very, very unique um, in the, you know, in the body uh, movement and presentation to that particular guru. So we have Pandanalu style, we have the Vadavu style, we have, you know, so many other styles. Um, the uh, Tanjo style, we have the, then later on the Kalakshetra style and many other styles of dance and these became, these dancers were trained only in one, under one guru and they had no exposure to anybody else. Those were the days when there was no exposure and also the gurus were kind of very, very um, insecure about their, uh, you know, choreographies being copied by other gurus and about, you know, by other dancers. So they kind of clannish and they kept their clan together, they heard together, the gurus and the dancers and whoever else performed. But this was very for a very, very, very short period. When we do, you know, talk about globalization today, I mean like 30 years ago, or technology, the advent of technology, let's talk about television, for instance. And when the national program of dance started, or the regional programs of dance started, then dancers started copying the best of the movements of other dancers. So the, the gharana naturally dissolved. I mean, so one could not come on stage and say, I'm the best representation of Pandanalur uh, school of dance, or I'm the best representation of Vadavu school of dance, because the intermingling had already started. And when an artist sees something that is aesthetic and beautiful and, you know, and doable, very easily doable, and imitable, you know, and you can imitate something so easily, you will naturally do it. And that's what they did. So if they had to do Kiratharikatom in a particular way and they were taught for years and years to do it, they thought this looks more graceful, so let me do it this way. So they started imbibing many different um, stylizations. I mean, I would call it stylizations because like, I know Leela Ji will probably agree with me. These were specific to those individual gurus. And even when I was a young student, I was often asked, what do you perform? Do you perform Pandanandur? So I said, yeah, I started off with Pandanandur because U.S. Krishna Rao, you know, uh, my first guru was Meenakshi Sundram Pele's student, and he learned the Pandanandur school when I went to um, Muttu Swami Pele, who was from Katamanakuri, Tanjo, so he was doing the Tanjo school, and he himself was a very innovative uh, guru, a very sort of a, you know, uh, different kind of a guru, and he had incorporated many ballet movements in Bhartanatyam because he had many French students who came from the background of ballet. And you know, so he re and it was very, very special. I mean, the linear form of Bhartanatyam, he had already changed it to a geometrical form. He knew the he knew how to explore space, he knew how to explore um, you know the dimensions of the body in space and the movement. And that was I think because of his exposure to his French students who came in multitudes to learn from him. So, and then I went to Kalani Narayanan, and Kalani Mami just taught me Abhinaya. So what we do today is basically a combination of many different things. And what I perform today would be a very, very, um, you know, specific and a particular style of mine, because I also bring my understanding of mythology, of the epics, of literature, of poetry, painting, my own life experiences to my dance. So when we talk about, you know, like this, what, what are the dances that we do? We do dances of um, human beings, I mean the relationship between human beings. Gods in some cases, goddesses in some cases, the children in some cases, and in many other, you know, uh, dances we do ordinary folks. Ordinary folks, their reaction to a situation, their action, their reaction, and, you know, human interaction. So I think a contemporary dancer stands before you, she's already bringing in all this. There was a movement in the 80s, and I want to mention this particularly because there were all these, um, uh, you know, uh, forerunners, forebearers of contemporary dance movement who decried classical dance, who said that it was out of context, irrelevant, non-contemporary, to be able to project their own style and their own club dance, and they called themselves you know, um, the con you know, the contemporary voice of dance, contemporary dancers. But I think that this movement is organic. Anything that you do with innovation has to be organic. Because you, there, there's no cut and paste in 
you know, a dance form, in an art form. So whatever, I mean, the artists take the dance forward or sideways or whatever, they push the envelope, they do things with the art form, but not necessarily cut, discard, and try something totally different and call yourself as a protagonist. In that particular time, you know, we had these dances where the, um, the, in the main, uh, in the Bhatanatyam format, you have something called the Varnam, and the main protagonist, the heroine, would always be waiting for her man. And you know, you have this heroine who was waiting, pining for her lover, uh, most often some god, and everyone started, you know, uh, attacking classical dancers, and I was one of them who was attacked, saying that you're so contemporary and so feminist in the way you, li you know, live your life. So why are you showing this dancer who's waiting, pining, crying all the time for her, you know, lover, you know, or be God, whoever. So I said that, you know, like I said, classical dance, the emotions in classical dance gravitate towards the absolute. Love is not an emotion you can deny whether you are traditional, conservative, or contemporary. And all the other emotions, the sub-emotions that come because of love also are something that are natural to a human being to be able to portray. It's not something unnatural that you're showing. So waiting, loving, um, you know, giving, pining, crying, being angry that your lover is, you know, has, is, is not around. And then when he comes, fighting with him, asking him to get away, and repenting that you asked him to get away, and later calling him back and telling him, okay, let's reconcile and be together, is something I'm, I'm sure the most contemporary individuals do in life on a daily basis. So I wrote an article and I called myself the feminist Naika. <coughs> and I was happy to call myself the feminist Naika. So there was this movement in dance too, and then we have, you know, like I said, this isolation started between the various art forms because of specialization, because everybody wanted to be a professional, they had no time to meet anymore, they had no time to dialogue, discuss, or talk about their work in a very informal space. Art happens always in an informal space, and there should be a place where one can candidly discuss art, each other's art form. Now we are in a place where we are walking on eggshells, and we are scared to criticize or discuss or do anything with anybody else because we are all specialists. And we want you know, to protect ourselves, our dance, our image, our hierarchy in the field, as would others want to do it. And I suppose there lies the problem because it's only when you step down and you're able to mingle with artists of all genre and able to communicate with them on a one-to-one, -one, take criticism, you know, a healthy criticism and be able to interface with them. But of course, even they should be able to take criticism. It's not a one-way street. And only, only then can something uh, beautiful emerge in the artistic field. So I'm sure that, you know, this forum will give us the opportunity to discuss, to talk, to interact, to interface, and see where we can go, because I have always had friends in every, from every field of art. Aruna will vouch for that. And, and so will Jatin and Rama. So I have no problem, um, you know, in dialoguing, interfacing, discussing my art with any artist from anybody, or even writers for that matter, or poets, who I've gone to and ask the meaning of their poetry before I started, you know, uh, choreographing for a performance. Um, Aruna, I just want to say one little thing. There's something called, I mean, they're classical art forms, you know. Generations, from generations, they have passed on to the oral tradition. And then there is, like you say, you know, classical culture, like he said, popular culture. The cinema comes under mass culture. And why? Because cinema marries art with technology. And technology is not an original art form. Technology is technology. So when this marriage happens between um, an original art form and technology, there's some <coughs> level of dilution that happens. And that is why it has taken um, all these classical artists so long to recognize cinema as an original art form. And I, you know, I mean, no offense meant to anybody, but I just, it's just a point that I'd like to put forth. Thank you so much. Seven minutes for each one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no. Uh, 
I frankly don't know where to start. The reason is, um, yes, I don't. I know a few people in the audience, and all of them are guys. Unless there is one-to-one -one meeting with people for a longer period of time, there will be a dialogue or an interaction can be established. So um, I've been a teacher, I'm a practicing artist, I devoted my life to work. Um, but I'm at a loss that um, when I lived in the Zamudin in New Delhi, I've been here for almost 50 years, um, dancers, musicians, painters, poets were in and out of the house only three or four times a week. And uh, then if a poet friend arrived in Delhi to telephone or ask a word with some few friends, so eight or ten people will come and he reads his poems. And you spend a whole evening together with tea and sing the poetry and have a little a drink which is shared and a tea <coughs> which is put out a uh, few things that's available. So, but it, it would sound like name droppings if I said almost every dancer, musician, painter, architect, theater person we met. Uh, there's a sea change now uh, uh, in terms of events like this, or on television, or in media, print media, and the exhibitions. We, all my painter friends we meet now only the exhibition openings, where if I say Gai Thong Le Thai, I would say Ram or Paramit, Ram Chandan, they all came in and out of the house. So they knew, they saw your work at the beginning, at every stage it's growing. So we knew each other intimately like this. Now, uh, recently, <coughs> I've my, uh, shifted my studio somewhere, and last three years, four or five people are looking into my face and putting things and I find letters. I sent an invitation card to the Prime Minister or somebody, and each one of them wrote a letter, signed. That sorry, I'm like I'll try to come to your show, but all the best, signed. You know, and things like that. Or somebody saw your work, or in the studio, or at the exhibition, somebody has written four, five-page letters. There are at least 200 letters from Sousa, and so on. While I'm talking about this, um, there are a lot of misnomer in the society, in the art forms, uh, what is performing art, literary art, visual art, you know? And we are a hodgepodge country. You know, we don't know how much we have taken from the West, how much we should take from our tradition and contemporary. Each one is saying, I'm a contemporary artist, contemporary dancer. Uh, that one is a classical dancer. I'm sorry, I'm totally at a loss. I don't, you see, we're giving, you know, it's very sad, and I really feel very sorry for the young people, those who are studying in school and college and the university, that they don't know whether they're going or coming. The division between art and science, we're talking of cinema. You see, uh, uh, art and science is like coffee and milk, uh, together, you know, and, uh, a lot of artists are talking about inspiration and they're doing new things, new experiments. The word is used by many uh, artists in every field of art, experimenting things and, and so on. So you have folk, tribal, classical, and contemporary in one hand. Then you have the oriental art and we in our country, and then the, uh, uh, the clusterization and synthesis between the Western and the So uh, like every language changes as you go 200 kilometers and, and your vegetation, so your craft changes and the kind of building architecture in Jammu and Northeast is different. So I don't know where to start unless we all know about art and architecture and dance and music and theater and food and vegetation of our country, we can't even have a dialogue about that. So, having said that, you know, this uh, seven minutes or one hour or two hours discussion is of frankly no consequence for us or for you.
unless we have been meeting continuously and sharing our thoughts and ideas. This is one. The other is, let's start from a premise. If I'm painting, it's not necessary to exhibit or say. But if you are doing theatre or cinema, it is meant for an audience. I've written a poem, say so a, a, a poem doesn't need a reader. You know, how many people know there are hundreds of painters who write poetry, you know, in our country. How many people know that all over the world, all artists, painters, dancers, musicians, architects, they cook lovely food, you know, this is one. I'm just uh, at a tangent, I'm rambling and giving you uh, uh, seeds for thought, and, uh, and so on. Uh, um, so if we know each other for a long time, if we have had discussion at this premises, say if there are lit fest and art fest, and there are, there are a lot of people feel sorry that my painting is not in the auction. You know, the painting is not auctioned. So frankly, people should uh, be happy that the paintings are not gone to the auction. Nah? But because the price rise, when Gaithonde uh, died, one very important magazine wrote that his price will be raised. Another, another you know, because there is debt and that the price will rise, uh, uh, and then so on. So uh, one day at Lalit Kala Academy, it was function, one journalist asked me, where can I meet Yamini, where is she? So I said, if Yamini, if Yamini Roy is not a she, and you can meet her there. <laughs> so, you know, um, I am doing an art center in Bhubaneshwar, for the JT Center of Art, and we hold a national documentary film festival on art, of which Aruna is a, a, a you know, staring person. And one journalist came to uh, uh, Anur Gopal Krishnan while his film was being shown and asked him outside, what do you do? I said, I'm a friend of Jatinda visiting. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying, uh, let's just be exposed. This is a great country with great amount of uh, knowledge, ideas, art forms available. You don't have to go anywhere in the world. Uh, you know, Obi Vijayan was a cartoonist a very famous great cartoonist of ours in New Delhi. And his son, Ramu, so he said to me saying that Ramu wants to go to America to study design. And can you be the referee? So I wrote that this boy, uh, the mother is Tamilian and father is a Malayali, and he should go and visit the states before going abroad. So I wrote this, and his professor said that's correct. We went to America for admission, he was sent back to spend one year to travel. Um, uh, there was a great uh, uh, ambassador in Italy, a friend of mine, uh, uh, and his three daughters are very few, and he was a scholar who knew 17 languages, and a great scholar. And his three girls are um, uh, fashionable, beautiful looking, they go to the malls and elsewhere. So when I was in Rome, I was staying there, so he said, can you talk to my daughters? He said, Uncle Jatin, there is no art in India. Look at 16 chapter. It's all craft in India. So what I'm requesting is, I don't know what kind of dialogue we should have. First, we should be exposed to our literature, our painting and dance and theater at the grassroots level. And you know, uh, as, I, as I said, the sea change, uh, when we were students in Bombay, I used to go to Rangbhavan and listen to Bade Gulavali all through the night and go to the class of the tea from there, you know? And uh, uh, every, all the visual artists go to dance and music and poetry readings and etc. But the dancer and musicians don't do that. Uh, uh, you see, I'm talking of a ghost here, I'm talking of poetry reading at home, looking at work at its context. You know, uh, the British did a fantastic job, of course, setting up museums, which is called Jadughar in Calcutta. And otherwise, it's a Sangrahalai. It's a storage place. It's a very good act. But I think uh, we, uh, if we have a museum, but suppose there are remains of Konara, which should, the museum should be near Konara. You know, 
so that there's a contextual thing, and then so on. So, you know, uh, we are blessed with so many languages, so many different kind of food, and dance, and music, and theater, and painting, and that you don't have to go anywhere. I'm talking of uh, uh, when I was to walk from JJ to my hostel, it's about seven, eight kilometers, I was to stop at Barakulam Ali Khan's studio. And she said, aha, kya bariya sugandha ra hai, kya pakra hai, or thoda bhaiyan bhi fried up there, now aurek liyaz kiya hai. So, if you uh, rub shoulders with poets and dancers and musicians, they don't have to be famous, they don't have to have a placard on their head. Eh? There, are, there are great singers and musicians and painters all over the country in lanes and by lanes. Eh? And then if you become Sahad Rudmi and Sahar Hidai, then if you rub shoulders with it, then you become a Rasika. And, and when you become a Rasika, then Rasakrahan is easier. So, talking about art and whatever four letter words after that, and you know, but Kaise? Saat uh, Aadas Minit Me Baat Karke, the evening was made, it will appear in the paper. It's of no consequence unless we have a grounding at the grassroots level at home. The institution is home and primary school where these exposures are given. Then only sense of art and aesthetics can be formed. Having said that, now present situation in the country that there are artists who are going to a gallery and looking at the size of a gallery and they are doing their paintings to defeat that. There is Mark Rothko at a time when so much of popular art was done, he was doing spiritual art. And as I said earlier, that uh, uh, a painting or a poem which is done, it's not necessary to expose it, not necessary to bring it to the public notice at all. But, you know, this dichotomy exists. I mean, I'm, a, I'm an artist of this time, but I don't call myself a traditional artist of contemporary artists. Uh, and a lot of people ask, Ajay, you also draw, you also do in, uh, things like that. So if, uh, if you meet a young person uh, who's painting, I say, what do you do? He says, I'm an artist. You know, uh, I, I wrote when I was in my 40s, 50s and 60s, I'm a painter, I want to become an artist. Artist is a very big word, you know, and, uh, uh, meaning uh, you are capable of well, Krishna was an artist. Yeah, he's showing me the other time. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I have nothing to say. Thank you, Sureshji, for asking me to speak the last because whatever I have to say has, has been spoken so by, so <laughs> spoken by, and especially in the case that I really have to keep it short, so it's it's beneficial to me. Um, I think from a dancer's perspective, uh, Pratibha gave a fantastic um, view and I, I, I agree completely uh, with what she said. Just, uh, just a few points that I would like to add. Coming back to the specifications of today's topic, specifically, I think from the day that sculptor made the dancing girl bronze image, the figurine in Mohenjo-daro. Since that day, maybe before, I think this whole dialogue and getting inspired and interaction between art forms has begun. And after thousands of years, and this country which is so complicated as Japanese said, and after invasions and uh, foreign rule, our arts have survived and flourished. So there is something right that we have done. Something that we all have done together collectively. So this interaction that we talk about between art forms, no art can exist in isolation. We all know that. And then when, a, when an artist becomes a, a performer and she, she or he brings with her all that she has assimilated, like Pratibha said. But 
But I think it has to be inculcated from day one by the Guru. That is, I think, very, very essential. You know, like the moral science class that we had in school of, you know, you shouldn't lie and you shouldn't steal and you shouldn't um, deceive people. I think right from day one, it is very important for the gurus and of course the parents to inculcate this, this, this thing in a dancer, I'm speaking from a dancer perspective, that how important every other dance, every other art form is. And then to open the minds of the students, to open the doors and windows of the students and, and give a very broad perspective of the art to the students. Like for example, if you're teaching the Nataraja pose, it's very important that the guru shows the bronze image of Nataraja to the student. If you're teaching a specific Naika, it is important to, to, you know, to show the miniature paintings of that specific Naika. So I think it is right from day one, the guru has to inculcate this feeling of, you know, this wholeness, this holistic approach towards um, the dance form. Because I think dance is the most fragile of our art forms. Our shelf life is the smallest. We make the least money. And when we have, when our physicality is really supporting us, we've not emotionally grown. And when we've emotionally grown up, our, our physique doesn't support us. So that span, when the physical and the emotional growth is at its optimum for a dancer, is very, very short if you're a performer. So I think in a case where the dance form is so, when the art form is so fragile, it is very important for the dancer to open her eyes and ears to everything that is aesthetic and beautiful around her. Anything that is beautiful, it could be the pallu of a sari, it could be the way the clouds are moving, it could be the way the deer is, is, is jumping around. But it's important for the dancer to catch it, to look it, to assimilate it. And that process of osmosis has to happen from day one. And it can be, and the guru also has to inculcate, of course, reading, reading literature, reading poetry, and to be exposed to, to literature in multiple languages, not just in Tamil and Telugu, the most of the compositions in, in Bharatanatyam that are second. But it's important to be to be exposed to all of this. So I think Right from the beginning, we dancers have to open our doors and minds to, to, to the life around us, to the world around us. And I think being, being an Indian classical dancer is so different from being a dancer of, in any part, part, of, part of the world. Because I think it is, it is not just, like I said, we make the least money, so it's definitely not profession for it, is, it becomes part of us, it becomes becomes a life's journey. So our attitude towards our dance is so different from the attitude that I have seen um, that dancers from other classical uh, genres all over the world have. So it is, it is something that we are always trying to seek. We are trying to seek something through our dance. So I think sometimes I feel we should not call ourselves dancers, we should call ourselves seekers. Because everything that we do is immersed, is laden with metaphors and allegories, and it's all the time we're trying to reach out to something with our dance. So this whole attitude towards dance, and this whole uh, thing that you signed up for when you become a dancer, is so very different. And we have to understand this. And like Arunaji said, that if you make a film on Pratibha, you'll, you'll know about this journey. So it's just watching her dance and then watching the, knowing about the journey. Because I think if you make a film on every dancer in this country, you'll have a story. Because there is so much that a dancer comes with, so much of grit, so much of uh, dedication. I'm not saying other dance forms don't have this dedication, but I'm saying that Dance itself is so it's so difficult to be a dancer and, and to remain a dancer for the rest of your life and not do anything else and just dance. Just be a dancer. It is it is a Herculean task. But we all do it happily. And we all do it with with uh, with this with this support that we know that that we are representing something beautiful.
and why they, we may look as though we are in our silos. It may look. But I think the, the, the walls of our towers are seamless for us. It's very easy for us to walk out and come back and be cozily encased into, in, in our silos. But just because we are encased in our silos does not mean that we cannot step. And I think it's also important to come back to that silo, come back to that comfort of, of, your, of your art form, of your guru, of your tradition, of your garana, of your, of, of your training. You come back to it and then you walk and come back. You move and you come back. And then from an outsider's perspective, he may think that, oh my God, that person is right inside and you know, trapped in that tower. No, but for us, those walls of that tower are seamless. Regarding audiences, I think we, uh, Avnaji was talking about her dancer friend who did not want to go for a painting exhibition and a painter friend who did not want to go for a music concert. But what about audience? I've known of audiences which will not step into a dance concert. They will only go for painting exhibitions. Definitely. They will only go for painting exhibitions and they will not. Dance is like, ah, no. So I think audience, we need to make a collective approach. So don't put the onus only on the artists. We need to make a collective approach. We need to we need to work on this collectively. And I think audience should have more, they, they need to have an open mind and they need to, uh, and I think you will understand painting more if you watch dance. And you will understand music more if you watch dance. So the onus is also on the audience. The onus is also on dance presenters, art presenters, on organizers. It is also on them to challenge uh, the artists and to challenge the audience. When you challenge the artist, you automatically challenge the audience. Because when you challenge the artist, you are challenging the artist to walk out of her comfort zone. And when she does that, obviously the audience is also getting something new. So it is important for the audience also to walk out of their comfort zone and try to understand, assimilate, enjoy something different, something new. And anything that is excellent, if it is different and new, why not? If, if we have maintained the levels of excellence. Of course, that is the primary a uh, rule that whatever you do, there has to be excellence and there has to be organic, like Pratima said. It cannot be an overnight thing. So, it is also the responsibility of the organizers to commission such work, to commission work which can, which can uh, push boundaries. And it will help the, the dancer, it will also help the audience. Like for example, I did a production called Chitravali on miniature paintings. So I looked at miniature paintings and a lot of people have worked on, a lot of dancers have worked on miniature paintings, so I'm not the only one. But when I started looking at these miniature paintings and I started you know, looking at them, finding movement in them, because I thought something must have happened before and something will happen after this point which the painter has captured. So I, I found movement in the painting. And then I tried to to create a story around the painting. But you know, after some time, I started getting jealous of the paintings because the paintings were so beautiful, and I could not. I I felt I was not doing justice. So what happened? I pushed myself. I I worked and and I and I and I and I did a lot of research, and I tried to achieve the excellence and the beauty and the message. Uh, and the story that the painting was trying to tell. So it helped me so much. And then when I presented it, dance lovers became miniature painting lovers. And you know, people who bought, looked at miniature paintings started uh, liking dance. So I think it is important to have this interaction in two last things. Um, there, is, there is a program that I did uh, with um, on birds with a friend of mine called Arshia Betty, who loves birds. And when he presented this at uh, the WHO, dance lovers became bird lovers, and bird lovers became dance lovers. So I think it is, for a dancer, it is not only important to be alert and, and, and sensitive to the world around her aesthetically, but also I think socially. I think 
we are wearing blue today because because of rally for rivers. So we, you know, we as dancers are concerned for even for things that are affecting us uh, socially in our present day modern times because our dance, we, the, the, the weapon that we have in our hands is dance, which is an extremely, extremely effective mode of communication. So we can do something about running for rivers, which, which will help to, to raise awareness um, on, this, on this issue. So with this, I would like to end my short talk. Thank you. Such a beautiful gathering of artists. I only miss uh, classical uh, musician on the day, whereas it would have made it complete. So, uh, uh, the, you know, one comment and a question, which you had actually mentioned uh, when uh, Pratibha had mentioned about the technology, saying that the technology is diluting the art form. I think there is a reverse also, which is true. I'm submitting it to you, ma'am, that uh, technology also enhances the art form, like all the things which happen in the stage because of the technology brings it to a much higher level. So this is my humble submission. There is another point which I would like to mention. I see that this silo is much more stronger when you talk about science. In science also I find that people who are scientists are no less an artist. They are creative, they are innovative and they spend a lifetime doing like what Rama has been telling me they also spend a lifetime. So also a doctor spends a lifetime. So also an engineer spends a lifetime. So the arrogance of the artist that I am very different perhaps may not be proper. That is uh, my comment. The question is about the gharanas. See, at least in the same type of an art form, let us break those titles. The Bharatanatyam dancers also, who has learned from one guru, may not be communicating with another Bharatanatyam dancer. And that those silos must break. I don't know why it's not breaking. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have two questions, ma'am. Uh, first question is for you, Aruna, ma'am. Uh, last uh, seven, eight years, I have been observing that, especially in cinema, the way it's been picturized, you know. Uh, they, they go to the fam most uh, outdoor shoots and they all the shooting is done, but they blur the background compared to what it was in the 70s and the 80s, which used to bring freshness to the scene and the appearance and, you know, it used to be something different. I agree that the focus has to be on the uh, hero and the heroine who's uh, art is performing, but what is the reason behind spending so much of money and then going ahead and blurring the background? I just want to say, uh, okay. uh, I have okay. And the second question, ma'am, please. Please. Uh, I'm brief, ma'am. The second question is for uh, Rama ma'am and Pradeva ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to ask, how do we, if someone wants to learn a classical dance form, how does one they decide which dance form to go for and who's, who's the guru to choose? Which guru to choose? Mind open 
and France has been such an open country, and I would like to know one heart thrown in that country which has not been influenced by a whole lot of influences coming from any number of uh, features of life and all other art forms also. So I think this is a question, ultimately it's a comparative term when you say we are living only within their own Karana. Yeah. I mean, it's a question of how much you are willing to go out and open your mind and uh, be with the others and see what is happening all around the world. But I think every artist, every guru, everybody has been influenced by a whole lot of sources. What are we talking about? We don't live in isolation in this world. And India has always been open to so much that has happened all over the world and we've been absorbing all that. belongs to a particular person. I see something I'm influenced, but I bring it within my dance art form or my music art form or whatever it may be. But so you are not influenced by other art forms. I think it's influenced. Everybody is influenced. The question of degree. Yes. Uh, okay, I'm going to start from here. Since I'm going to ask this piece. So start from here and we go to the end. And then you can do that. That gentleman, um, that gentleman said that uh, gurus don't interact with each other and gharanas don't interact with each other in dance. That's absolutely not true. Because right from day one we have been having gurus who have influenced each other and gharanas were... And like Pratipa said, now there is no longer any gharana. Everybody is, is taking what suits them to their body, to their mindset, to their thought process. And, uh, and bringing it to their own, and actually every dancer is their own gharana. So now it is wrong to say that the gurus are not interacting with each other, because we as dancers can vouch for it. Thank you. Uh, I won't argue. No. Uh, I, I won't argue. We can have a discussion afterwards. No, I won't argue. absorb the dance more from her. And uh, Rukmini Arundel was uh, influenced by Anna Pavlova, 
who she went to learn ballet from. And Anna Pavlova told her, you have beautiful dance forms in your own country, so why don't you go back and learn Bharatanatyam? And she's quoted this in her biography, and that was what influenced her. So if you want to learn this young man, and you should you know, watch performances of all dancers that you admire and respect, and choose what you instinctively and intuitively have you know, a feeling for and what you want to dance. Have I answered your question? No, why don't you? I mean, how do you choose a guru? I, I mean, I, you know, in the same way that you choose, like I said, I mean, you go watch performances, see and see what appeals to you and, and who do you naturally, you know, gravitate towards. And you go to that guru and request him and if you're lucky, they'll take you on. <laughs> Uh, whether you want to study the school, uh, biology, physics, medicine, how do you make a choice of what you want to study, and which college you want to go to? It's a very existential question. Yeah. Thank you very much. much. Oh, the other person who I wanted to respond to has left because he had a question for me, so I think I'll let that pass. Rawal's part answered his question about uh, Gurus, I mean, about karanas and whatever stylistic uh, differences, which are, which no longer exist, of course. But he also spoke about cinema, and I think for me, and maybe that is why he left. Thank you. Uh, I know. I know. I I I when the architects say that architecture is the mother of all arts, the music is the epitome of all arts, and so on. But you know, all these discussions have taken place over thousands of years in our country, the discourses. Uh, seeking a guru. Certain circumstances, uh, like finding a guru or a teacher next door to you, and so on. But I lived in my hometown, whoever was there, to go to that person. But you see, in schools and colleges and home, I'm sorry, school, private schools and at home, we do not have a vocational guidance. If your sister and mother and brother are drawing, painting and singing, or you're listening to music in the radio, whatever, this is one aspect. That the most important aspect is close to nature. You know about Vishnu Narodha, about uh, how a prince went to learn something and sent to another guru and then eventually that he spends time in nature. So all the art forms evolved from nature, the art of nature and man-made art. Uh, by, you know, the very uh, sad situation in our country uh, is our education system is very faulty and the upbringing at home is most important whether, you know, music, dance, theatre, painting, etc. should be a part. And amongst them, food is an important thing. If you, you, you see, I remember my grandmother used to say, if you plant flowers, you offer it to Krishna, or you put it on your hair, or you put it in a flower vase. Not just plant it and throw it away. So, growing up in the proximity of nature, and uh, because answer to every art form and science comes from nature, and other gentleman was saying it is 100% true as scientist is an artist, of course. And this separation which is made, uh, you see, if somebody is teaching physics and chemistry, they are nothing like physics and chemistry separate in nature. They are nothing like dance and painting and music separate in nature. It's all a part of a process of uh, one uh, uh, taking the journey to the other. So. Uh, uh, Say, I, I, I go to many schools in the country or university and I find they are uh, completely misled by teachers how to paint and draw, they are doing oils. You know, um, uh, a lot of parents bring their children and say, Jatin, can you tell us how this child will, what are the books you should refer to? All the books which are available from overseas, uh, drawings are made with numbers and you fill in colors are terrible things. They should be all discarded. So when I say give your children just some paper to draw, they think I've not given them any uh, book reference to any books they can study. Just sketching and drawing. 
Now when these dancers are teaching dance, I would, I'm not a dancer, but I would suggest instead of learning Bharatanatyam or Odyssey, they should learn body movement, enjoy the body movement. Likewise sketching and scribbling on paper, and then so on, you know. Uh, so uh, one is the proximity to nature, the other is all the art forms to be relished every day in the family and in the school. The education is very faulty. The somebody draws a mango on the board and tells you to draw, then you lose interest, and so on. And then, of course, the vocational guidance and certain accidents did that take place. One day, um, I was drinking coffee and I was doing some watercolor, and by mistake, my brush went to the coffee. And I applied, and I saw, my God, it's lovely brown sienna. And so I did a series of six paintings of coffee and watercolor, you know. So accident, and um, every scientist, every artist, dancer, musician, whoever, what the sort, uh, accidents is a thing that you immediately, like a hawk, observe and imbibe it into your work. Thank you. Uh, okay. Because <coughs> I do want the last word because here yeah, everyone's really talking about the arts, which everyone knows the dance, music, uh, painting, etc. But no one really talks to cinema as an art form. But to me, it is possible to know who talks about cinema as an art form. Everybody knows. Everybody knows and talks about it. No, at this moment we didn't, but everybody knows. How much? So how much you can learn from cinema to admire beauty, to understand things, it goes beyond visual attraction uh, and opening up words that you cannot experience in your life. It takes you to places you cannot go to in the course of your life, which you can see them as well. I, anyway, I can go on talking for one hour about it. But, then, but cinema is not in a, now recognized in India as one of the greatest art forms there is, and which it really is, and is beginning to come up as a great art form now, which, which uh, people are hopefully going to be beginning to recognize. But I want to end with something which has got nothing to do with cinema as a great art form, but a great filmmaker, something he said, which has always stayed in my mind and I've put it very often was when Aravindan said to me many, many years ago, he said, if I listen to Hari Prashant Jolasya, I may not learn anything, but I come away a better human being. Yeah. That brings us to the close of the day. I just briefly wanted to say something about the observation that Cinema is a composite culture. Uh, I composite think art form. composite art form. Sorry, yes, yes sir. composite art form. But I think, like, uh, I mean, when you are doing <coughs> dance, producing a dance uh, uh, a production, uh, making a production, you did a production to those miniature paintings. <coughs> you bring things from the different streams into the state. So I think composite or your that becomes a very relative term kind of thing. So maybe we can discuss it afterward, but it's an important point. Compromise, right? It's a compromise, not compromise. I didn't want to say compromise. Okay. I said compromise. Okay. But it's compromise. It's a compromise. Okay. All right. I've got, I've got, I have to interrupt. Just one second. I'll let you finish it and you can always. Okay. I just wanted to say something here. It was a very interesting thing when uh, I raised the issue of the art and the technology. Because that brings me to the next subject of the dialogue or the conversation that we are going to have on the 6th of October. Fourth. And, huh? Fourth. Fourth October. That is exploring art in the era of technology. So anybody who has something to say on that, please be here on that. Same time, 7 p.m. Thank you. or composite uh, form, I totally disagree. Because I, as a painter, was in New York, and I went into 
non-linear anything without having a clue of how to hold a camera. And so I must add that it can be a highly individualized expression, which I experienced as an artist, a painter, or whatever that I have done for through my academic career or what. So it was a new discovery, and it was movement, and it was non-linear editing, which opened the doors of my perception. So I think I must add that we're talking of an integrated perception and not just expression. Yes. So India has always had it as a holistic, integrated perception. The artist, the dancer, it's only later when we got colonized and fragmentized and you know divided in our perception that all these problems began and we didn't know how to deal with it. And so the confusion. And all the perceptions and the expressions are highly political ideas. And one can get into a huge debate where the perceptions lead to the expressions. There are, because perceptions and expressions are related to the identities that you want to talk about. No, you're talking about No, I'm talking on what an aesthetic idea. I'm talking of aesthetics. As an integrated perception, you know, not the expression that follows, but it's the perception that we must learn to, you know, uh, give its proper place and not throw the baby out of the, uh, with the bathwater and say that sab ko jo classical hai, traditional hai, folk hai, indigenous hamari culture hai, wo sab khatam aur hum sab mix match karke aur sport banayenge. I'll just use the word a hot shower. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you, thank you everybody for encouraging us and being here. Something which we do at the beginning of the thing, it's very delayed because Rama was, I was expecting Rama to come in. May I request uh, Ashim to, uh, as a token of appreciation, give a another to Rama to begin with Rama.